let's start recording. All right. Okay, just a reminder that uh, we're experimenting with changing the time around a little bit. And we're going to go from 12 to 1 today. See how that works. Maybe a little longer. Yeah, we'll see how that works. Uh, see how people feel about that. Um, and uh, we're doing that because it works better for some of the folks that tune in live out on the West Coast and for some other people that, that uh, need some extra rest and that kind of thing. So what's nice about a home church setting is you're not stuck in any kind of a routine. Uh, you can be very flexible. And so that's another thing that we want to emphasize that when you do something like this, it's really what works best for you and whoever else might be coming or tuning in if you do a stream. And so we want to welcome all you guys here. We want to welcome you all that are joining us online. Great to have you with us. Uh, we uh, hope that everyone had a wonderful week and uh, <clears throat> that you received the blessing that God has for us today. So with that, let me invite you just to pause a moment and let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you once again for the sovereign God that you are. And you do take such good care of us. You have a marvelous love for us. And you demonstrated that so exactly with sending your son to, to rescue us. And so we're thankful and grateful. And even though they're just words, Lord, we pray that, that those words would, would have meaning in our very lives. We ask that you would uh, guide and direct all those who are watching and maybe coming still here to our location, and that we would receive the blessing that you have for us. We thank you for your word, and as we open it today, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and to teach us. We need wisdom, we need insight, we need understanding, particularly now at this late hour in earth's history. And so we're asking, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for what lies ahead, and that you would use us in the finishing of your work. And this is our prayer. We humbly ask it in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, what we're going to do, because we're, <clears throat> we're shortening the time a bit, and if it works best that way for everybody, um, we'll have a couple of the news items, not maybe elaborate as many, but we'll kind of make that a little more concise. And there were two. Uh, I mean, all the normal stuff is going on out there. The fires and the earthquakes and the, the, the uh, storms and so forth. It's not normal for those who are dealing with it, though. Yeah, it's not normal. Unfortunately, uh, many people are injured. Many people are even killed with a lot of these things. And so that's, that's the tragedy of it all. But it's become the norm in terms of, of the expectation. You know, uh, New Zealand, for example, they have an earthquake season. You know, like we have over here a hurricane season. You know, they have an earthquake season. Uh, California has, you know, a, a season of potential fires, and of course, that every year they're dealing with that. So it's become kind of the expectation that floods, famines, earthquakes, hurricanes, I mean, it's just all kind of what to expect at some place somewhere on the planet. Anyway, all that's going on routinely. And of course, Ken, as you've brought up many times, there's still lots of crime and violence taking place. Uh, you mentioned some major earthquakes this week too. Yeah, and of course that may have been the result. That the fish kill may have been a result of that kind of thing. No. Uh, you think the it fish was? Fish kill has to do with toxins getting into the water supply from the industry in the area. Okay, it could be. It certainly could be that where you deplete the water of oxygen, which the fish obviously need. Uh, so, yeah, I mean the the animal kills, as they call them, you know, the birds and the fish and and other things have been, uh, again, becoming more routine. So we've got all that going on. Of course, the political news is all out there, and that's ramping up. Um, what you hear about that is that... It's almost uh, become boring. Yeah, well, what you hear about that is, oh, this is the most important election, you know, in our recent history. That kind of, I mean, you hear that about all of them. Uh, but there was one thing in the news that I wanted to bring to your attention that probably most people didn't notice, and would have, for God's people particularly, very grave consequences, and that was uh, potential consequences. Um, you know, in order to have a constitutional convention, you know, in the United States we have our constitution, and it's pretty, pretty rigid, pretty set in stone with the different amendments and so forth. And occasionally, over time, amendments are added. 
Well, in order to add amendments and so forth, uh, there has to be what's called a constitutional convention. If you're going to make any changes, you have to have a convention. In order to have a convention, two-thirds of the states need to say, we're on board with that. We would like to have that. Okay, two-thirds. So that's like 66 percent. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, out of the 50, <coughs> out of the 50 states, what, what, what's two-thirds of that? You know, somewhere around 40 or whatever it might be for you mathematicians, 30 something. Anyway, we're, there have been a lot of people and a lot of folks out there that have been wanting to have a convention, you know, for a balanced budget amendment, for, you know, all kinds of different things. But we as Christians, and particularly if you've read a book called The Great Controversy, you realize that at some point, in the history of our country, our Constitution is going to be, to, to be changing uh, to the detriment of those who follow God's Word. And uh, we got the news just this morning that we are within one vote, one state. Okay, Once, we're, 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 One more state has to come on board and they can call a Constitutional Convention. And that only tells me that it's another confirmation that we're near the end. All right, another confirmation that we're near the end. And that the end time sequence of events will begin uh, very soon, I believe. Now there was another related news item that was also very revealing for the Christian community and God's people. And that happened in Arkansas. Anybody know what happened in Arkansas this week? I know, I know Rose knows what happened in Arkansas. At the, state legis at the state legislature grounds, at the state house, the grounds there where the state house is for Arkansas, one of the things that they've been trying to do there, or, or maybe they have done, I don't know. Well, what, they, what they've done is they're, they're protesting the fact that the legislature allowed the Ten Commandments to be posted at the state capitol. State capitol, right. So they brought in this 84-foot high 85. statue of Baphomet, which is a satanic statue. Yeah, they brought, they brought what they did because the uh, because of the uh, state legislature passed an amendment to, to be able to display the Ten Commandments. Uh, satanic groups brought in this statue of the satanic statue of this goat man, so to speak. Um, and I'll show you a picture of it after. After a and un unveiled it right there on the grounds. It's an 85 foot high statue, quite uh, hideous looking, of um, uh, this particular satanic symbol. And of course, people were crying, you know, hail to Satan and all this kind of thing. And so you've got this, you know, you got that agenda working its way, you know, as the undertone of uh, what's going on as well. So, what do you think that's going to do when satanic groups, you know, under the guise of, you know, we have religious freedom in this country and if we want to promote that, you know, we can promote that. And if you set up the Ten Commandments, which is a standard for the Christian faith, you know, we want to set up our standard over here as well, and that's only fair. Okay. Now, the result of that is going to be kind of waking up a sleeping giant. You know, it seems like most Christians are content with just sitting back, sitting in the pew, you know, going to church, you know, uh, on their day of worship, and just being content, uh, not, not trying to step on anybody's toes, not to cause any concerns about anything. Most Christians seem to be in that camp. Um, but when satanic groups start to do, start to embolden themselves with this kind of thing, uh, I think it's going to start to wake a lot of people up. It's going to start multiplying. Okay, it's going to wake a lot of people up. And of course that again is an end time uh, aspect, that's an end time aspect of of the Christian right, if you want to call them that, uh, gaining some popularity and gaining a measure of control over the government. Now, according to the book Great Controversy, what really will happen is 
as the country moves more and more in a kind of a heathenistic direction in general, God's spirit is withdrawn, and because of that, lots of natural disasters begin to fall even greater than, you know, the, the fish kill kind of thing, which was horrific, uh, is only a part of what will be unleashed on the planet. And of course, as that happens, the, the Christian right says, look, you know, in order to stay this, in order to stay God's hand of judgment, we need to get back to Him. We need to legislate a day of worship, you know, we need to really get people back to worshiping God. And that's when your Sunday law legislation will start. It's been making its way uh, through the uh, legislative process already. That's when it's going to then become front and center. And most people are going to want to go along with it because they're going to say, hey, you know, we want God's blessing. We don't want God's judgment to fall. We want His blessing. And we've had His blessing on this country for a long time, and we have taken it for granted. I'll tell you, folks, we have really I'm taken sure it for granted. Yeah. So... It's, it's all in the scheme. The whole thing is playing out exactly as uh, the Scripture Bible says. Exactly as the Bible lays it out. And so, Which means uh, that Satan's plan right now is, is dominating, but God's still got, got everything under control. I can't right. believe you started in Arkansas. Okay, so those two, those two news items. Bill and Hillary are from the Clinton might have had something to do with that. Um, <laughs> all right, let's move into our study time. Uh, if nobody has anything else they want to share. Um, and we were in Romans, in Romans, you know, 13, 14, the last couple of weeks we've been there. We want to focus more on Romans 15 today. But Paul has the undaunting task. You know, God has called him to this undaunting task, of, daunting task. Of, of, of bringing together, this daunting task, of bringing together. <laughs> That's our Lasaurus. We call our Rose Lasaurus over there. Thesaurus. Thesaurus. See? Works all the time. Works every time. She got anyway. a mind like a steel trap, she you know. Does. You don't miss nothing. She don't miss a thing. Don't make me feel bad. You don't miss a thing. Anyway. Um, Just call me Grammar. Grammar. <laughs> um, Paul has this impossible, God has laid on him this, this mission to bring together you know, Christ has come, he's, 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 he's made the atonement with his human sacrifice and his divine sacrifice. And now Paul recognizes there's no reason for, you know, he, he left and he promised to come back. There's no reason for him to delay. But we've got all these people that are becoming Christian now and they can't get along. Why can't they get along? Well, you've got Jewish Christians trying to come together with Gentile Christians. And I'll tell you what, just like water and oil does not mix. Does not mix. Does I, not think mix. I think it's somewhat like the United States was during the Civil Rights Movement, where people had blacks and whites separated for generations. You know, separate water fountains, separate restrooms, separate places yeah, to eat. I remember that And myself. so when integration became forced, well, there were churches that had to deal with that too, and it was not a happy time in a lot of churches right. trying to right. integrate, you know, churches. A lot of people just would not go along with it, didn't like the the integration process. Well, and when you've grown up in a certain mindset, like they have in the Deep South, where they thought that the black population was less than human or whatever, right. it's very hard not to bring those prejudices into the church when you're in the church. Right. The theory of evolution had set the stage for all of that. Uh, distortion in terms of those relationships and, and of course people grew up being taught that this was an inferior group of people you know um, even the Jews have had to deal with that over their course of history you know they, they were inferior as well well it's very easy when when you think about the Christians who came came who were a part of Judaism they had a huge despising among the Jews of the pagans, those who worshipped false gods. And so they didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans, with the Philistines, with any of these other nations that were around them. And now all of a sudden the disciples are coming out not only bringing people to faith in the Messiah within the synagogue, but bringing in these people from outside. Right. In fact, the, the, the Jewish attitude for the Gentile community is 
that they're, they're less than animals, you know, that, that we despise them, we, we actually hate them, and, and we, don't want to, we don't want any part of them because they will defile us, right? And then we won't be able to, you know, minister in the temple, we won't be able to be a part of God's people because we'll be defiled. I mean, when, when you, I mean, they treated them like a disease, right? That, that was their perspective. These are like a disease. These people are just, unclean. But yet, yeah, unclean. But yet, Paul is. Paul knows that these are people. These are human beings that that Christ has died for, right? That he wants to. That he wants to save. That he wants in the kingdom. I can't imagine, you know, when the reality of that that task really set into his mind. How he, I mean, he, he had to have an incredible amount. Of, of grace and endurance and perseverance and all those things that come with knowing that you're in the will of God, right? Knowing that this is your mission. Uh, he had to have utmost confidence in that. And of course, he went through all kinds of wild experiences. You mean shipwreck, bitten by snakes. I mean, he, you know, poisonous snakes. I mean, he was, he was fearless in a lot of ways. And he would have had to have been to try to bring these people together. Right. Well, he, he kind of rebuilt on that. <laughs> and so, start with. The part, this part, now he's talking to the Romans particularly here, but he's going to have the same circumstance wherever he goes. To Thessalonica, to Corinth, to Rome, to, you know, to, to Ephesus. No matter where he goes, he's going to have the same situation to deal with mm -hmm. because of the... Um, uh, the culture and the traditions that have enveloped and taken control of these different groups of folks. And uh, so that's what Romans 14 and, and 15 are really going through. And I'm going to read this. Are we, gonna, are we doing Romans 14 or 15? Uh, well, I'm going to read just a little bit uh, in Romans 14 to take us into 15. Um, I mean, the big obvious factors are lifestyle issues that, that Paul's dealing with, things that have become cultural for the Jews, things that have become cultural for the Gentile community, right? And so he's dealing with those issues specifically here, uh, but, he's, but he's also trying to just establish a principle or a premise, right? Paul was a Jew, he just... Uh... Right. I mean, you know, when we go all the way back to... Uh, Cain and Abel. Remember Cain and Abel? All the way back thousands of years to them. Cain asked the question after he had murdered his brother, you know, when God confronted him with it. He said, you know, hey, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. I mean, Paul is really asking a similar question. You know, are we our brother's keeper? In fact, of course, Paul probably offended a lot of people by saying, hey, that Gentile over there is really your brother. In Christ, that's your brother. And they were like, they probably recoiled. Oh, what? No way. You know? Well, then God, He revealed Himself to Paul on the road? He, yes, He did. And that is what? Okay. <coughs> so, I mean, that's the question that we really need to ask. Because we live in a diverse world today, don't we? Amen. We live in a world today that's every bit as diverse as it was back then, probably more so. Oh, yeah. What do you think today? I'd say. Uh, and there are major religions out there, uh, hundreds, thousands of denominations, you know, tens of thousands of different interpretations on the same, supposedly the same book, right? So you got people running just practically in every direction, and yet God says, what I'm really calling for is unity. That's, that's what Paul's really calling for. And he, he's really calling for a marriage. In this case, with the Jew and the Gentile, he's calling, calling for them to come together and to be one. Right? He's really calling for a marriage. Um, let's go through. I'll just we'll go through and read this, and then we'll go through kind of a little study on it. But keep that question in mind: Are we really our brother's keeper? Are we our sister's keeper? Do we have a responsibility to one another? We have a responsibility to help them along too. Yeah. Okay. And see, Paul's really bringing all of that to light here. I'm just picking it up in verse 13 of chapter 14. It says, uh, and I'm reading from, uh, I thought maybe reading from the, 
International Children's Bible here that it would give us a little more clarity. But uh, it says, so we shall stop judging each other. It's verse 13. We must make up our minds not to do anything that will make a Christian brother or sister sin. I'm in the Lord Jesus, and I know that there is no food that is wrong to eat. But if a person believes that something is wrong, then that thing is wrong for him. If you hurt your brother's faith because of something you eat, then you are not really following the way of love. And so what's he really talking about here? He's talking about... The freedom to eat bacon. Yeah. <laughs> freedom to eat bacon, right? Well, okay. I don't think that has anything to do with what God said was unclean to begin with. Right. There's, there are some people that would interpret it that way. That's why I'm reading this version, because to, to, to show you that some people would actually interpret it that way, right? Okay. What do, what do we know about clean and unclean foods? God set that principle the standard. God set that principle up all the way back during the time of before the flood, during the time of Noah, where he told Noah. Before there was ever a Jewish person. Before there was ever a real Jewish person in existence, he set that principle up of when he told Noah, take clean animals and unclean animals on the ark. Okay. Yeah. And right, the un, obviously all the animals that God created were were created for a reason, but it would be only the clean considered the clean animals that would be used for offerings and for food. And for okay. Food, right. For food. And of course, we know today scientifically there's there's good science behind God's counsel. Well, isn't that right? There's good science behind God's counsel for humanity. God made this machine. This is a bio-machine, right? We're a bio-machine. God made the machine, and he said, here's the best fuel for that machine. If you take uh, your vehicle and pull into the, the gas station and decide, even though you have a gasoline, or even though you have a diesel vehicle, gasoline is cheaper, so you're going to use that this time because you don't have much money, so you're going to use gasoline in your diesel vehicle. Is that going to work for you? That is not going to work for you, I guarantee you. It's not going to work. Okay, you're going to burn your motor up, right? So, so you have to put the right fuel in the machine. What Paul's talking about here is that certain people think that if they eat a certain way, that will guarantee them salvation. And he's saying that we have to look past that rigidity and recognize where our brother's head is in their thinking. And be conscientious of that. Okay? The Jews had reached the point where they thought they were being saved by their works. By their works. Instead of having their works indicate that they, they were, were saved. saved. They were, yeah. Right, exactly. Okay. And, and the, that was a real issue in the, in the early Christian church, too, you know, because people naturally want to do what's right when they're following the Lord. Okay. And some people get very zealous and want so to do what's Paul right. Paul is really talking, you know, he says here, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how it reads in the King James. If you hurt your brother's faith because of something you eat, then you're not really following the way of love. What he's really saying here is that we need to be more sensitive, more sensitive to where others are in their walk of faith. We need to be more sensitive to that. I mean, how many, how many people, of course, probably everyone here and, and most people that I'm talking to, would know that in any church congregation you have little cliques. You know, there's always little cliques, little groups of people within any, any church congregation. And one group might be more liberal, and another group might be more conservative. And even within that congregation that supposedly believe all the same teaching, there's a lot of conflict and a lot of times a lot of infighting. Okay? Anybody hear of any infighting in a church congregation? I mean, it goes on constantly, right? Yeah. And it's because some people are more rigid and, and more conservative, and they'll get offended if, uh, if something is suggested that they should do. Or, you know, I mean, there's, again, there's this well, insensitive... They're more rigid about what they think other people want to do. Other people, right. And some people, of course, want to play the role of the Holy Spirit, and they want to tell their brothers and sisters, you can't do that, and you must do this, etc., etc. Okay? So you've got all that... He's saying we need to be more sensitive. He says, do not destroy his faith by eating food that he thinks is wrong. So, are you the mature Christian? Are you the, the grown-up Christian? Are you the Christian that can say, hey, I, I can put that off 
if I know that it offends somebody else. Susan, I don't, I don't Susan have has a comment about this. She says mm -hmm. that <clears throat> knowing where they are at spiritually requires having a relationship with them. It doesn't come without a relationship. Exactly, exactly. But see, Paul knows from a cultural standpoint, he already knows how rigid the Jews are. He already knows maybe how he was liberal. One of the most rigid himself. Right, he was one of the most rigid, and he knows maybe how liberal the the Gentiles are, and that they're just babes in the faith. You know, they're just they're just coming in, getting the milk of the word. You know, they're not even getting any of the meat yet. And of course, he's fearful that the faith that they do have is going to be destroyed and crushed. And listen, all of us have seen that take place in church. I'm, I'm, we've seen that take place in churches today. We've seen people come in, and they're they're young, they're they're young in the faith, and somebody comes along, maybe even well-meaningly, and just crushes them. Hey, you can't do that. You can't wear this. You can't eat that. You you know, you're an abomination to God if you this and that. I mean, well, that was one of people. the things I was talking with Elsa about. Was um, I was talking about how when we went to Floyd Church, I never felt like I wanted to invite my friends to it uh -huh. because it was so geared directly towards Adventism that I was like, I, I feel like it would just make my friends think that I'm crazy because it, they would just immediately be dropped into this like Adventist stuff, you know? Right. You know it's true, and Christians in general have developed their own language their own and language. ways of talking about things and different right. denominations have their own language too. Yeah. Okay, so do not allow what you think is good to become what others say is evil. In the kingdom of God, eating and drinking are not important. That's the way it's phrased here. Um, I, I would kind of disagree with that statement, right? Would, how, because we, because we are... Which statement? Uh, just the way that... How, how does verse, 16 read, uh, verse 17 read in the King James? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, right. but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay, he says here not important. He, 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 uh, That's why you got to be careful with these paraphrases. He paraphrases, okay. Uh, eating and drinking is important, right? Uh, I mean, we we know from just from science that it's important what you eat and what you don't eat, what things that you leave alone and things that you just from a health standpoint. Okay. <clears throat> eating properly and eating things that are good for the body that promote health and vitality, what does that do to the spiritual nature? What does that do to the mental faculties? You see, what you, it is important because what you put into your body, the fuel that you put into your body is going to have an impact, have an impact on how you on think, think on how effort. you think, on how clearly the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart. Okay? So it is of vital importance. But we do have to be sensitive, and we don't want to crush somebody that's new in the faith, right? Because they have not reached the place maybe that you have reached in your Christian experience, in your Christian walk. It says here, the, 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 that verse goes on to say, the important things are living right with God, which would be peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit, okay? And again, if you're sensitive, again, you, you, you need, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to, to make us more sensitive, uh, to make us uh, less rigid in, in our thinking, etc. Okay? But more tolerant, at least initially, for, for others. That we need to allow them the chance to grow. Anyone who serves Christ by living this way is pleasing God and will be accepted by other people, etc. So let us try to do. So let us try to do what makes peace and helps one another. Do not let the eating of food destroy the works of God. This was a big issue. Uh, this was a big issue for the Jews to get past. This was a big issue for the Gentiles to get past. Paul knew this was going to be a stumbling block that he had to deal with, and every place he went, he was going to have to deal with it. It says in this translation here, all foods are are all right to eat, but it is wrong to eat food that causes someone else to sin. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that will cause your brother to sin. Um, I think really most people naturally have an attitude. You think you think that most people have an attitude that, hey, I I can eat and do what I want. And it, it really doesn't matter what effect it has on other people. 
seems to me that that's the typical attitude today, right? We can do what we want, it's not, you know, etc. It says your beliefs about these things should be kept secret because you and between you and God. Okay, a person is blessed if he can do what he thinks is right without feeling guilty. But if he eats something without being sure that it is right, then he is wrong because he did not believe that it was right. So again, he's really emphasizing the sensitivity that we need to have toward others. In other words, we need to think of others first. Isn't that what Christ really demonstrated? Thinking of others first and himself last. Right? And that's really the attitude that Paul's promoting here. Be conscientious, you know, be sensitive. Um, whether you think it's right or wrong, be sensitive. Some people have, have well, this Well, most idea. people don't, just don't know. Right. That's right. And, and we can't hold them accountable for what they don't know. Well, that's what you... you the, the, we never did, uh, you know, uh, teach all that. We just let them pick it up on their own. And what he's saying here is that we don't want to let our right knowledge and practice destroy someone else who may be new in the faith. That's really what he's saying. It's, it's a matter of priorities. You know, some people think that the truth is so important that they have to hammer everybody with it. And the truth is important. And the truth is important. Is important. But, but it how is not you as use important it. as bringing people to the Lord because the Holy Spirit is able to... You don't use it as a hammer. Yes. Yeah, what does he say in another place? He says to be wise as serpents and harmless. gentle or harmless as doves. Okay. So there has to be... You know, just like the enemy has a strategy to try to, to distort and, and bring you down, schemes to bring you down, you know, God has a strategy to, to incrementally help mold you and make you after his will. Okay? All right. Um, let's read through 15 and see if there's anything that's different in 15 that, that really 14 hasn't addressed. And then we'll go into talking about how we can really bring uh, together the, uh, Christian, the Christian community. Chapter 15 says, uh, We who are strong in the faith should help those who are weak. That's, that, that seems like that's a wonderful thing. <coughs> we should help them with their weakness and not please ourselves. That's all what we've been saying. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to help him be stronger in faith. I like the way the King James puts it. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Yeah. You know, it means we need to recognize that we, I guess I'm thinking back to the example of um, Jacob and Esau. Uh -huh. And Jacob traveled more slowly. He was going back home and he knew he was going to encounter Esau, but he said he was traveling slower to take so that the women and children mm -hmm. could handle the trip. Right. You know, it would be very common for him as the leader to say, we've got to get there, we've got to get there by a certain time, and be so destination-oriented that you had to go as fast as possible. But he said he would let us lead on softly, lead on softly. so that the women and children aren't overtaxed by traveling. Mm -hmm. Genesis. Well, you know, we just had a, a new grandbaby, a new grandson, and he's a couple of days old now. Right? A week old today. A week old today. And so, you know, when, when, when Mama and I go to visit, we're going to expect him to be serving us beverages and, you know, having a good conversation with us, you know, about his rich. first week of life, right? I, we don't have, see. We don't have that expectation because we know, <laughs> right? We know that he is an infant. He's incapable of, of, you know, maybe even he's not even really making sounds per se at this point. So he, we, we, we already know that a lot of growth has to take place before he can talk with us and communicate and, and help us in any way. Why can't we translate that into our spiritual experience? Why can't we say, this person is, is new in the faith, or this person hasn't had the advantage culturally to learn anything about the requirements of God? You know, Why can't we understand that, that we have to treat them like an infant, like a babe? And we have to lead them on softly, as Rose is talking about there. You see? So, so he says, bear you one another's burdens. Bear you one another's burdens. You know, why is a serpent gentle and harmless as doves there? Okay, even Christ did not live to please himself. It was as, as the scripture says, when people insult you 
it hurts me, he said. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that we can have hope. That hope comes from the patience and encouragement that the Scripture gives us. Patience and encouragement come from God. And I pray that God will help you all agree with each other the way Christ Jesus wants. Then you will all be joined together and you will give glory to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ accepted you, so you should accept each other. I mean, wow, if, God, if a righteous, holy God could accept sinners where they are, take them where they are, and then try to lead them and mold them and, and take them where He wants them to be, who are we to reject other people who are sinners? You know, we're sinners ourselves, right? Yeah. So how, how, who are we to reject them? That's what he's saying here. Love God can do it. Too. A lot of this has to do with understanding that God created all of us with, our, with a free will. He did not create us to determine what His will was for everybody else. We are to get to know Him and know what His will is for our lives, right. but it has nothing to do with what somebody else is supposed to do. Anytime you see something or someone Try wanting to, to set something up to control someone no, else's ability to choose. That's not a good And it, that, that works in government too, I mean, right. because His government is all based on free will. We choose to serve, we choose to love. You can't force those things. You have to do them because you choose to. And so when our government steps in and tries to force us to do a certain thing a certain way. Right. They overstep, they've government. overstepped their bounds. They've overstepped. And the same thing yeah. in the church. If you're trying to push someone to accept a new doctrine that they haven't heard before, yeah. you don't have the right to go push that. And I would say to anybody out there, if you have a dictator as a pastor, or, or elders in your church that are dictatorial, you need to think seriously about finding another place to go. Okay? Because that's, that's kind of Catholicism. That's what brought on the Dark Ages. You know, we're going to force your conscience. We're going to tell you what you should do, what you should be, how you should think, how you should live. And then make that is you not do it Christian. Or cry. Right. Do it or die. Do it or die. I mean, the, when the, the Jesuits colonized and supposedly went out as missionaries, that's what they did in these foreign countries. They destroyed all of the histories and libraries of the Mayans and the Incas and these various peoples because they believed, first off, that they were pagan, which they were, but you're still destroying all of their culture, mm -hmm. and they forced them to become Roman Catholics or right. be killed. Right. Yeah. You know, that is not God's government. That's not God's way of doing it. He's never forced any of us to do His will. Right. Verse 8 continues here, I tell you that Christ became a servant of the Jews. This was to show that God's promises to the Jewish ancestors are true. And he also did this so that the non-Jew or the Gentile could give glory to God for the mercy that he gives to them also. And then it says it's written in the scriptures. And he quotes the Psalms and Deuteronomy here in Isaiah. So I'll praise you among the non-Jew people or the, or the Gentile people. I'll sing praises to your name. The scriptures also say, be happy, you non-Jew or Gentile, together with God's people. In Psalms it says again, And you non-Jew, praise the Lord, all you people. Sing praises to Him. See, Paul knew all of these Old Testament references here. So he knew that the Messiah had come for all people, not just for the Jewish people. Okay? Uh, verse 12 there, Isaiah says, A new king will come from Jesse's family. He will come to rule over the non-Jew or the Gentile. The non-Jew will have hope because of him. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Of course, what the Jewish people fail to realize, Isaiah 42, talks about their mission was to open blind eyes, to unstop deaf ears, to take the gospel message to an unconverted world. That was their mission. And, uh, of course, they, they just... If you read that verse in the King they James... They wanted to keep it all for their son. Yeah. If you look at that text in the King James... Isaiah 11, 10? No, Romans 15, too. Oh. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. trust yeah. Not in him shall the Gentiles fear. Right. You uh, know, that, because they lived under the Roman rule, and the Roman rule was, you, we, we own you. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, and so he, this was the Gentile will trust. This is, implies a different type of government, government leadership yeah. than the, the, the world is used to. Yeah, something that you can appreciate and applaud. Verse 13 says, And I pray that God who gives hope will find you with much joy and peace while you trust in Him. Then your hope will overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now Paul next talks about his work in this uh, latter section of chapter 15. He says, My brothers, I am sure that you are full of goodness. He's talking to the, the church there. I know that you have all the knowledge you need and that you are able to teach each other. But, <clears throat> but I have written to you very openly about some things that I want you to remember. I, I did this because God gave me this special gift, and that gift was to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentile people. <clears throat> I serve God by teaching His good news so that the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, could be an offering that God would accept, an offering made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I am proud of what I have done for God in Christ Jesus. I will not talk about anything I did myself, I will talk only about what Christ has done through me in leading the non-Jew people to obey God. He wants them to understand that, you know, this may be offensive to some, but this is what God called me to. You know, this is my purpose as a Christian brother in the faith. It says, they obeyed, they obeyed God because of what I have said and done, and they have obeyed God because of the power of, of miracles and the great things they saw and the power of the Holy Spirit. I preached the good news from Jerusalem. All the way around, and he, and he lists here uh, uh, Illyricum, or Illyricum, Illyricum or Rissum. Definitely a town we don't have today, I right. guess. Right. And that, that was a town that um, the whole, this was a Roman province, quite, quite extensive province. And if you look on a map and you see the Mediterranean, you know, you got the Mediterranean Sea here, which Jerusalem is, is up to the kind of the northeast. Or northwest, and you got the Mediterranean here. Well, connected to the Mediterranean, to the kind of the northeast, is the Adriatic uh, Sea, right? And the whole coastline of the Adriatic Sea is this Roman territory that he's talking about here. It's uh, it's, it's quite extensive. Actually, the Roman Empire controlled all of the then known world, didn't it? One, the most part. one quarter of the world's population lived under Roman rule in the first century. I mean, think about that. 25% of the world's population, you know, about 250, uh, I think they estimated about, at that time, their, their world population was about 250 million. So, one quarter of those people lived under Roman rule, uh, they estimate. And so, Paul says, I finished that, that part of my work. I, I always uh, want to preach the good news in places where God's people have never, or where people have never heard Christ. I do this because I do not want to build on the work that someone else has already started. So Paul said, you know, God's taking me to places that are what we would call dark where areas. Where the gospel has never been preached. Right, where the gospel has never been preached. And he said, I, I don't want to go to some place where there's already preaching going on because, you know, that's, that's not necessary. There's already somebody there doing it. Mm -hmm. Another way to put that would be like stepping on someone else's toes, you know, getting on somebody else's territory where they're already working, you, what you want to be the most effective is you want to go to the places where your, where your message is needed. Sure. sure. And if the exactly. Christian message is already being preached, there was no sense in going and preaching it there. And I know you and I have talked about the fact that, that there are other people with a certain particular message to, to the Christian community, and there's no reason for us to, you know, resound that same message or, or whatnot, because again, it's, it's already being done. Uh, Etc. I think I think when we were talking about uh, the work for the poor, right? You know, the Salvation Army and that kind of thing. Right. We were talking but about they're, they're, they're doing they're a good already work. doing we a good work. We don't have to duplicate their work because there's right. plenty of other work that can be done. Exactly. So. <clears throat> okay, but it's written in the scriptures: those who were not told about him will see, and those who had not heard about him will understand. Again, that's in Isaiah. So. Basically, what Isaiah is saying there is that um, is the same thing Titus picked up on. For the grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching them to deny, you know, worldliness and ungodliness, etc. Right? It's, it's, that's in Titus the second chapter. So Titus is picking up on the same concept from Isaiah that the gospel message is going to go to the entire world. Jesus Himself in Matthew 24. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, unto me, and then, then the, end will the come. end will come. Okay, so again, the Bible's pretty consistent, and that's what Paul's Paul's saying. I'm 
part of that. In fact, Paul's contention is that that actually was accomplished in his day. Okay? Paul's contention is that the gospel went to the entire world. See, that's why he had that expectation that the end would come, because the gospel had gone, in his opinion, to the entire world. Okay, okay verse 22 there. Um, this is why many times I, I was stopped from coming to you, because he, he was going someplace else. Now I finished my work uh, here. Since, since for many years I have wanted to come to you, I hope to visit you on my way to Spain. I will enjoy being with you, and you can help me on my trip. Now I'm going to Jerusalem to help God's people. The believers in Macedonia and southern Greece were happy to give their money to help the poor, among God's people at Jerusalem. What was significant about that? This offering that Paul took up uh, from uh, the believers in Macedonia and southern Greece, and they're going to, to provide money to the poor people in Jerusalem. What's the interesting thing about that? What kind of what kind of believers are typically are really what what are the majority were, of believers in Jerusalem? They were without the majority of believers, believers in Jerusalem are, are, are what? What kind of believers? They're Jewish believers, yeah. right? And here in Macedonia and, and southern Greece are Gentile believers. So here you have the Gentile believers sending money to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. And that, that, was, that was astounding, right? Because again, they despised one another. And here you have the Gentile community really stepping up to the plate and mm -hmm. saying, we want to help our Jewish brothers and sisters. Because they're in need, you know? Mm -hmm. And we are one in Christ. And if we're one in Christ, we're, we're really equal, right? There's no... So that was a brilliant uh, move on Paul's part. I don't know if he initiated that or if that was something that they just, they saw the need and they responded. But that was uh, actually a great unifying aspect there. And we should be willing to help those in need, right? Yeah. And differences of culture and, 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 and whatnot should just be all set aside, um, etc. We should prefer our brethren. And it says here, they were happy to do this. See, it was a joyful offering. They really, and, and, they, and, and Paul even goes on and he says, and they really owed it to them. I don't know how that, that reads in the King James, but it was something they wanted to do, and it's something that they felt responsible to do. Well, we have a responsibility to one another. So he's saying that they, they really owed it to them. These non-Jews have shared in the Jewish spiritual blessings. So they should use their material possessions to help the Jew. So in other words, it was, you know, they were the Jewish people had had the great knowledge and great insight into the Torah, and they were sharing that insight with, you know, their spiritual blessings with the, the, the Gentiles. And so yeah, let us, you know, you're giving us this it was a barter going on there, wasn't it? There's really a barter happening there. You're giving us spiritual insight. We're going to give you material things. You know, it was a nice, it was, that's what Paul's saying here, it was a great barter. I must be sure that the poor in Jerusalem get the money that has been given to them. And after I do this, I'll leave for Spain, stop and visit you, etc. I know that when I come to you, I'll bring Christ's full blessing. Brothers, I beg you to help me in my work by praying for me to, to God. Uh, do this because of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love that the Holy Spirit gives us. Pray that I will be saved from the non-believers in Judea. And pray that, that this help I bring to Jerusalem will please God's people there. Then, if God wants me to, I'll come to you. I will come with joy, and together you and I will have a time of rest. And then he ends here and he says, And the God who gives peace be with you all. Amen. So, you know... You, you really get a sense of what Paul is having to deal with there. and uh, But Scripture is so clear, and of course in other places like John 17, for example, it's talking about as Christ was one with His Father, right? He wants us to be one with Him, and He wants us to be one with each other. Okay? So, with all the diversity that humanity has, and of course, we're not only talking about back there. We could, we could, we could, you know, Paul gave us a lesson in how diverse everyone was. 
uh, particularly the groups that were diverse, but yeah, what about today? I mean, there's such diversity, more diversity today than there was back then even, right? Yeah, there's a lot of it today. So how can we, how can we be one? How can we be one in purpose? How can, how can we be one uh, in, in mind? Right? Susan says the early church pooled their resources and many were added to the church daily. Yeah. Yeah, in other words, the goal and the objective, uh, and that's what Christianity does. It changes your focus, right? It changes your perspective of life. It's not all about amassing things for your own retirement. You know, we, we live in a culture here in the West where it's all about get a good education, you know, you go into debt, get a good education, and then uh, save up money for retirement and you'll be good. I mean, it's totally a secular philosophy, right? It's totally, we don't care about the neighbor, we don't care about the guy down the road, we don't care about anybody in need, as long as you secure your, you get, get educated and secure your own retirement. That's what it's about. I'm summing it up, of course. It's a lot more than that. Scripture advocates a unity, a oneness. Uh, and that's what marriage really is. It's this oneness. It's two diverse people coming together, becoming one. Here you had Paul trying to bring two diverse cultures together, become one. Today we have a world that's totally diverse. God says bring it together as one. When, when will true oneness actually be demonstrated in the near future? It's with a certain group. We talked about 144, the 144,000. Yeah, the 144,000 come together. I mean, these are people from all over the planet, different cultures, different, you know, different perspective, different upbringing, different... I mean, that's at oneness, but it's not like what I consider true at oneness in terms of like, it's not everyone at one, at one mind, because that's the only going to be achieved. Unity is not uniformity. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So unity is not uniform. In other words, God doesn't want everybody thinking the exact same thing, looking alike, dressing alike. He doesn't want a cult, right? He wants, he wants the oneness to be in Him. If everybody is, you know, think of a circle. I know, I just meant like truly united. united yeah. being what happens? Think of united. people in a circle. Okay, everybody's standing around in a circle. Think of maybe hundreds of thousands of people in this giant circle. And then they're focusing on one thing in the center. And as they're focusing on that one thing, they're supposed to walk to the center. Let's say in this circle, they're 10 feet apart from each other. What happens as they walk toward the center of that circle? They get closer together. They get closer together. Okay? That's the model that really Christ is wanting for His church. you got all this diversity around the circle, but as you focus on Christ and you walk toward Him, you're focused on Him. You're not, you're not looking at your brother over here, and you're not looking at, at things over here that are, are distractible. You're looking at Christ, and as you look to Christ and walk to the circle, right, you become closer to one another. Some, some have used the illustration of an orchestra. Yeah. that an orchestra has all kinds of people playing different instruments. You have some people playing the same instruments next to each other, but you have strings and woodwinds and horns and drums and all of those things. So, um, John, each of those instruments is different. John 13, 35. Some of them are high notes, some of them John, are low notes. John 13, yeah. Some of them are, are, are play all the time, some of them play very little, but they're each playing the part in this big musical score that was meant for them. And as long as they play together, all of their differences the combine to make this beautiful, beautiful sound, sound. Yeah. and the only time that it gets out of out of whack is when they when they lose track of their timing or whatever and they're they lose their part what they're playing and that's what paul is saying we have a bigger part it's not about right. us here and now saving ourselves yeah and each person that makes a sound with a, a particular instrument they add value and integrity to the overall music right. right and that's what that's and what no we part need. is any more important than any other right they are all important to get the sound that the conductor is looking for he needs all of those parts you see that's what got a job and yeah. that's what paul's wanting us to recognize the same thing that's what paul's wanting us to recognize as christians today he wants us to see in other words if they're in christ if they've given their hearts to christ they're headed in the right direction right and he wants us to, to, to recognize the value that that person in Christ brings because God has blessed each person with gifts and abilities, right? That are necessary in the overall orchestra or church. So 
students of them. They each know when to play their role. And they know when to play their role. See, this is all the important part. There's a discipline that comes. The in the orchestra. There's a discipline in an orchestra, right? And that's who, why they have the same. And they watch activity. the conductor, right? And the same thing is they're true. Not they're, a, they're, they're not the watching each other. They're not watching each other. They're watching the conductor. Is that where the comes from? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the vine. Everybody else is the branches. Right. So he's the the, the, the chief conductor, and he's orchestrating the church okay? and we use our talents and abilities at the right time and we're not looking at one another each other we're not looking for faults we're not saying you know this or that or you know whatever we're not trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit. Also, one, thing, one thing you learn in playing a musical instrument is that you know that every time you play it you don't always get what you're looking for in terms of sound so if you're in an orchestra and somebody hit plays a wrong note or plays at the wrong time you understand what that's like because you've done that before. You know, you've come in at the wrong place or you've chosen the wrong note or you've blown too hard or too softly and not gotten the sound you were looking for. So there's this tolerance. That's where you know practice. Yes. And so if you play a wrong note, yeah, practice. And so if you play a wrong note, does, does the whole the whole music score stop right there and everybody starts looking at you? No, it keeps going on. It just not continue, a good orchestra crew. It continues on, right? It continues on. And, uh, you know, the person that played the wrong note, maybe they're the only one that knew it was the wrong note, right? Maybe nobody else even picked up on it. But, uh, um, they'll stop and beat up the person. They don't stop the and beat up the person. Well, oh, I wouldn't person. pick up on it myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's been said that, it, that the Christian church is the only one that shoots their wounded. Shoots their wounded. That in the Christian church, it's so easy to pick each other apart and to find fault with each other and that's not the place that's not the role that we should have yeah. you know if you see somebody has a problem talking to them privately and working with them privately is the best way to go see we're yeah. talking about you here you don't have to tell them they're wrong you just have to discuss it till he sees it yeah. Yeah. we're talking about very basic fundamental <coughs> christian teaching here okay a mutual respect for one another is what we're really talking about what is what is john 13 35 by this all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Okay, so this unity that Scripture calls for, not, not, not universal, no, 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 not uniformity, not uniformity, but this unity that Scripture calls for, right, is something that's going to send a message to the planet, to the world. Okay? And, and so that's why it's absolutely vital that the Christian community come together. And I, I really don't see it happening until, at least at this point in history, I don't really see it happening until the 144,000 are developed and they, they basically sound that last warning message to the planet, you know, that's in Revelation chapter 14. All right, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.10, go ahead and look that one up, Sid. Wait, one ten? Yeah. First Corinthians one ten. <coughs> now I beseech you, yeah, beseech you, beseech you, <laughs> brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye are perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Okay, does it does that sound like uniformity? Yeah, that sounds like that's what they want to try during the Sunday law. Okay. Having the same, the same mind doesn't mean doing everything the same. If you have the same mind as someone else, you and I have the same mind on a lot of things in our lives. But we don't dress exactly alike. We don't wear our hair exactly alike. We don't tell each other how to dress or how to eat or whatever. We have that respect. Right. But we have the same mind. We're looking. We're working towards the same goals. And, you know, we agree on so many of these areas. All right. Some people look at the uh, scripture like this, and they think that in order for you to to dwell together as Christians, you all must believe the exact same thing. That is not what this is saying. Okay. In fact, you you would be you would be hard pressed to find 
two individuals on the planet that would believe the exact same thing. I, I think that's probably impossible because every person is created unique. Okay? So, but it's talking about... We agree on the fundamentals. We, we agree in fundamentals. We agree that, that Christ is the answer to any question that anybody might have. The Bible is his word and his instruction. The Bible is his word. I mean, there, there are fundamental truths that, that we can certainly abide by and agree with. Right? There may be little particular areas that people may have little variations on them. And they're not, they're not uh, salvational type of issues. Right? There are still salvational type issues that we must agree on. But there are lots of issues that people bring up that are not. And this is, you know, what colors the carpet in the, you know, on the on the church pews? You know, do we want pews? Do we want chairs? Do we want stained glass or not? You know, do we want this? Do we want that? You know, it becomes all about these differences. What is the opposite of, of unifying? What's the opposite of uniting? Dividing, divide. Divide. Okay. And it's the enemy that works, and is found that the that the the strategy, stratum, yeah, the strategy of division, is what keeps. Uh, the world in turmoil. Divine and conquer. Divide and re-fall. Divide and conquer. That's, uh, that's Satan's. He, he, he used that right from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. Right? And with the angels in heaven. Well, uh, even further, further back, right? With the angels in heaven. That's right. Exactly. It insinuated doubt, and that <coughs> doubt created division between so, them and God. Right. So it's all about divide and conquer kind of, uh, uh, of an attitude. So unity is the key. And uh, we need to to press toward that mark, okay? Um, <clears throat> every, everybody has, because God is, through His Holy Spirit, has given us different talents, different abilities, He wants us to, to see the value in each other in using those talents and abilities for the cause of Christ. Susan says that timing is crucial and no two snowflakes are the same. Absolutely, that's exactly right. But yeah. they all join together and produce a huge snowball. And the interesting thing about snowflakes is that they encompass all the colors of the rainbow, but because they're, they're, because there's such an abundance of color when snow falls, your mind whites it out. Snow is really not white. Snow is really not white. It's, it's a multitude of colors and your mind can't process the abundance of color, so it whites it out. Yes. Yeah. It reflects a bunch of colors. It, it's, it's reflecting colors. It's all of them are there. It's not. It, it actually is just. It's not a color. It's just reflecting everything. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> but yeah, it's all, all these different too. Okay. All right. Any other any other final thoughts anybody might want to add? Amen. Final thought. If you go through, you can go through a nice little study in Corinthians chapter 12. Um, and of course, really, God wants us to be unified. And we must be unified. We must send a unifying message uh, prior to the close of human probation. Uh, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heavens and the earth, and then, you know, the create Worship the Creator. Right? But not only worship the Creator, which means honor his commandments. <laughs> Susan says, "Is grass green?" <laughs> yeah. Okay, something to think about. But you said uh, it's usually brown up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So or tan. At any rate, uh, some thoughts to think about, and we want to not only think about them, but we want to implement these in our lives. We want to we want to be an encouragement to one another, and not a discouragement. Okay. And so let's purpose in our hearts that we'll encourage one another in the faith and encourage, uh, try to see the real value uh, that uh, God has blessed each one with. And let's, uh, let's move on and get the job done. What do you say? He said amen. Mm -hmm. All right. All right um, Elijah had to go, huh? Yeah, there was a delivery coming to the house and just got notified about to be there. Alright, well let me uh, let me lead us in closing prayer. If you just pause a sec. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for 
the God that you are, the God that does unify us in purpose, in love, in perspective. Um, how, how amazing that it's only you, Lord, that could take such diversity and bring together out of it something uh, so harmonious and so unified. And so we pray that our lives would, would become a part of that symphony that you want to sound that last warning message to our planet. Accomplish that in us. Uh, help us in thinking about that this week, ways in which we can play that certain note to give a certain sound to your, to your message that it might encourage others and others might be saved. So use us, Lord, in the finishing of your great work. And thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit in accomplishing it in us. And we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, so we want to thank you guys for following along and your comments and your thoughts. We want to thank you for joining us once again. Uh, next week we'll uh, continue, we'll finish out Romans here, chapter 16, so we're, we're right there. And then the following week we'll be back into the book of Revelation. Hope you have a great week. God bless. We'll see you back here again next week. I'm grateful again. When the moon finds hot before the reach of the sky. And the road starts to turn around. Leaping by the moon. Well, I guess we'll go see about the boss. The boss. Yeah. Anyway, you enjoy having you here for it. That's just having you here is going to be great. Yeah. 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 She cleans houses too. She was doing a quote for somebody. And she said, Rose, what's the name of the pill you gave? Um, I, I gave it magnesium. Yeah, that's what it was. They helped her. She said she's wearing, he said he said he put the bracelet on her. Oh, did you? Yeah, she did. It's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll buy some of them all the time. Right. I think it was the magnesium, the time release magnesium that we were. Yeah, that's what you gave me. Yeah. There's some on the table there. You need yeah. some more? No, uh, I'll want it. Uh, Let I me mean, just get a bottle for you. Yeah, I'll get a okay. bottle. I'll have it for you next week. I'll tell you I'm grateful. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you.